Okay. Okay. I've just started the recording. Um, welcome back to the class. All right. Any questions um, so far from Romans chapter eight? We have. Um, uh, we, we're looking at verses 26 and 27. I just spent a few more minutes on that. But any questions so far? Okay. All right. So in in the light of, of what Paul has said, you know, is the weakness of our flesh and also the sufferings that we're going through, saying the Holy Spirit helps us, because we don't know what to pray for, uh, as we should in different situations. But the Holy Spirit makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is this intercession is not independent of us. That word helpeth in Romans 8.26 or helps uh, in the New King James and then helpeth in the old in the King James version. The, the Greek literally means to take a hold of together with us against. So the Holy Spirit is helping us. That word help could correctly be translated. The Spirit also takes a hold of together with us against our weakness. So oh, I want to make it very clear that verse 26, 27 is talking about the intercession that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's not something independent of us. It's not like the Holy Spirit is going off and praying for us somewhere. No. He's taking hold of together with us against our weakness, whether it's the weakness of the flesh or whether it's our weakness when we are going through the sufferings of this present time. Because there is the overarching context, which is the weakness of the flesh, and there is the immediate context, which is the sufferings of this present time. So as we're going through that, and we don't know what to pray for, then the Holy Spirit takes a hold of together with us against this weakness of not knowing what to pray for when we, you know, when you're when we're battling the flesh or going through the sufferings of this present time, and he makes intercession. How? together with us because he's helping us takes all that makes it and together with us now this intercession is not just normal praying because it's 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 something coming from the holy spirit and that's what paul says it's groanings which cannot be uttered and it's it's right to say that this will include praying in tongues but we don't just limit it to praying in tongues the, the expression could be in any other way sometimes it's just groanings uh, it's just, uh, you know, the, you, you may not even be able to have ex express it through words, but it's that uh, it's something that's being expressed in your heart. And God looks into our heart, verse 27, we said, and he understands, he knows exactly what the Holy Spirit is getting across to him. And this prayer that's being birthed by the Holy Spirit through us in those to take uh help us overcome those weaknesses. It says it is intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we know that when we are joining with the Holy Spirit in this intercession, it's perfect. It's according to the will of God. No time is wasted. We are praying uh, just the way God wants us to pray. And in the light of that, he, verse 28, he says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So there are the sufferings of this present time. We're going through it. But this is our confidence that all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That means even though 
we are going through the sufferings of this present time. And even though all of creation has been subject to corruption and because of that, all these things are happening, that God is causing everything to work out for our good. So that's our expectation that somehow there will be God's purpose being brought about even through the sufferings of this present time, what we're going through. And we are praying, we are interceding according to the will of God, and we're doing it with this confidence that things are working out for my good, things are working out for good. I am love God, I'm called according to his purpose, so things will work out for good. And he has touched upon this word, purpose, in verse 28. So now he's going to build on that in the next few verses. Could somebody read for us, please, verse 29 and 30. Romans 8, 29 and 30. 29 and 30. Those whom God had already chosen, he has he also said to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many. Oh, we, we lost Aaron. Okay, maybe Aaron's line has uh, dropped. Could somebody else read it? 29 and 30, please, Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. Anyone else can read it? Sure. Sorry, Karan, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined this he also called, whom he called, this he also justified, and whom he justified, this he also glorified. Mm. Thank you. So, it says, oh, no problem, Aaron. Yeah. So, as we're going through all these sufferings, this present world time, we are praying with the help of the Holy Spirit. And this is our confidence that everything is working for good. Because we love God, we're called for His purpose. What is His purpose? Verse 29 and 30. 29 and 30 are very important scriptures. Um, so what he's, let's just break it down. For whom He foreknew. So He's talking about us, people who love God or called according to His purpose. And He says, God foreknew. Now that's the om omniscience of God. He foreknew. He knew ahead of time. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. To predestine means to, to plan this out ahead of time. So he knew beforehand and he decided beforehand that these people, what did he predestine? He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He didn't predestine their choice. But he predestined that they would be conformed to the image of his son. So that's very important. Because many times people read, you know, Romans 8, 29, 30s, oh, see, God already decided whom he's going, uh, who's going to be saved. No, 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 no. Whom he foreknew, that means God knew ahead of time 
your choice, my choice. He knew our choice. So we are the ones who make the choice. God doesn't determine the choice. God didn't predestine your choice. He foreknew your choice. And he predestined or determined beforehand what? Not the choice you will make, but the ones who make the choice to follow Jesus, they will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That means they will be put into that image. They'll become like Jesus because he is the firstborn among many brethren. So we are the, he predestined us that we should become like the brethren of Jesus. That means we should be like him. That's what he predestined or predetermined. He did not predetermine our choice. He foreknew our choice and predetermined that we'll be conformed to the image of his son. So that's the plan that God had ahead of time. So, verse 30, whom he predestined, these he also called. Now, God foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So he said, okay, all the people are going to be like Jesus, going to become like him. They are the other ones who become the called. Now, does that mean God only calls the ones he predestined or does he call everybody or is the invitation extended to everybody? And those who respond to the invitation become the called. That's the question we need to answer. Because there is a school of thought which says, well, God already predetermined things. He predetermined who's going to be saved. And uh, they are the called. Now, if that was true, then there is no need to preach the, for us to, you know, busy ourselves and give our lives to the preaching of the gospel. Because, hey, if God only decided who's going to be saved, let them be saved. But that's not the, the New Testament. The New Testament tells us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means give everybody an invitation. It's up to them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, that means anyone can believe, the invitation is open. But out of the whoever, the ones who do believe, they become the called. And they come into this program. They become the ones God foreknew, God predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, and they are now the called. And those who are the called, he also justified. That means he said, okay, you are now declared righteous. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. He said, okay, now your heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Is our verses 29 and 30 clear? So theologically, there is Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism takes that place where it says, you know, God already decided who's going to be saved. Now that's quite dangerous because then it doesn't give us any room to go and preach the gospel, tell people to be saved or pass the invitation to everybody. No, no, no. There is the overarching plan, which is, God foreknew, then he predestined that these people who will say yes will become like Jesus. He's going to make them like Jesus. He predetermined that. And then the people who did say yes, the ones whom he foreknew, they come into this predetermined plan of God. They are the ones who become called. They are the ones who become justified. And they are the ones who become glorified. So that's so Arminianism says, look, you have to make the choice, which is respecting the 
free will of the individual. It does not deny the sovereignty of God. It does not deny that God foreknew or God predestined or uh, God called, justified, and glorified. It doesn't deny that, but it says each individual must make the choice. Okay, so uh, there are these two schools of thought, and uh, and I just you know put that forward now. If you ask me where I I, I fall, like I just explained, this is. Uh, you know, we have to be consistent with the rest of scripture and the rest of scripture makes it very clear that the indiv um, the invitation is given to every person. The gospel is for everybody. The cross is for every person equally. But the ones who make the choice, they become the called. They become the chosen ones. They become the ones who are justified and they become the ones who are glorified together with Jesus Christ, right? So all things are working together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? His purpose is he has predetermined that everybody who comes to Jesus, who believes in Jesus, will be conformed to the image of his son, these are the people who are called, who are justified and glorified. That's God's purpose. So all things are working together for good. And they are actually working towards God's purpose, which is to get us to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus. So that's the good we are looking for. While we go through the sufferings of this present time, we are praying and interceding with the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, we have this hope that things are going to work out for my good. What good? We're going to be conformed. You're called to His purpose. What is His purpose? To be conformed to the image of His Son. So that's the purpose. And you look for it. See the dots. Hey, I may be going through some hard times. I know that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. But there's also a purpose that's being worked out in my life. And somehow God is going to make the sufferings of this present time come together in some way to fulfill that purpose, which is to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. That means to become more like him. So you look for that good. Wow. That's something worth it. So when we go through some challenges here in this life, and it, uh, God is making it work together for good, what is that good? Look into your own life. Say, wow. I went through that, that helped me become more like Jesus. And that's the purpose God is working in each one of us, every one of us, whom he foreknew, he predestined, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the purpose he's working out. So everything is working together for our good. To those who love God, and those were called according to his purpose. So having said all this, Paul wraps up, or he goes into this, uh, verse 31 onwards, he goes into this almost celebratory proclamation that, hey, here's like the... You know, the, I'm summing up everything and I'm just celebrating all that God is, has done for us. Okay, so that's verse 31 to 39. Somebody could read that, please. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, please. Romans 8, 31 to 39. Anyone quickly? What then shall we say to these things? 
if god is for us who can be against us he who did not serve his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things who shall bring a charge against god's elect it is god who justifies who is uh, he who condemns it is christ who died and for her more is also risen who is even at the right hand of god who also makes intercession for us who also separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pain or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are accounted as sheep for he sometimes yet in all the things we are more than conqueror through him who love us for i am purchased then neither death or nor life nor nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor highest nor deep nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord amen thank you so as paul is uh, you know now kind of just putting all this together uh he's you know he's bringing all all that he said so far he's bringing it together and then he's going to change focus he's in, in, in his in his writing uh, he's going to shift to another entirely different uh theme he's bring all this together and he does it by asking these four rhetorical questions like you know it's been something very unique about the book of romans again uh, the book of romans is very unique Uh, uh, like we said in many ways and one of that is in paul's style of writing uh, only in this episode do you find him using this whole i uh, concept of uh, rhetorical questions meaning he asks a question and he himself answers it uh, so it's kind of you know uh, we've seen it you know all the way from romans 2 and Uh, he keeps uh, he asks a question then he gives an answer he asks a question he gives an answer he asks a question he gives a, so it's very unique uh, in how he has uh, uh, presented the teaching uh, uh, that that God has put in his heart so he's asked now as he brings all this together he's asking four questions uh, and of course he's going to answer these questions uh, but it's almost like these are the questions that you know uh, that are coming up in the minds of people or which he would like to come up in the minds of people because he wants to summarize hey these are the main things i've been telling so far so the first question of course verse 31 he says so what do we say to all these things that means all right we know we're going through you know the sufferings of this present time we know we're facing hardships we know we're you know we're going through all of this so what do we say well in other words what is our reaction what is our response to all of this well our response is if god is for us who can be against us i would look i may face the sufferings of this present time and i'll be going through all this but my response is if god is for me this could be against me and so that's the first assurance god is for me and not only is god for me the other thing is this god did not spare his own son but he gave himself up won't he also give me everything else that means there is this assurance of god's presence god is for me 
there is also this assurance of God's provision. Hey, how do, what's the assurance? God didn't hold back his only son. Won't he also give me everything else that I need? So, while we are going through the sufferings of this present time, while we are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body and the glorious liberty that's up ahead, while they're going through all of this, what do we say? God is for me and God will provide for me. God is for me. So who's going to be against me? God will provide, God gave his only son, so he will surely provide for me. So that's our assurance. God is God's presence, God's provision. God's presence, God will provide. God is with me, God will provide for me. God is with me, God will provide for me. God is with me, God will provide for me. As we journey through these things, he will not hold anything back. He gave his own son. So won't he give me everything else? That's in verse 32. So what's the believer's response or reaction as we journey through life? This is it. God is for me. And God will provide for me. The next question he asks is, verse 33, who can accuse? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? So this is the answer he gives. God himself has justified. So, um, so who can bring an accusation? So Paul has already explained this whole truth of justification. So he says, he sums it up in this. Look, God has justified you and me. So there's no more accusation against us. Verse 34. Who is he who condemns? Who can condemn us? Again, Paul has already explained to us that Christ died for us. But he's risen. He's at the right hand of God and he makes intercession for us. He's there and he's there as uh, saying that, look, I've already made the provision for their life. So who can condemn us? Who can accuse us? Who can condemn us? Right. So we live with the sense of knowing we've been justified. We live with the sense that the one who justified us is there at the right hand of the Father. The one who made justification possible for us, who died and rose again, is there at the right hand of the Father. So there's no way any condemnation or any accusation against us will prevail. Now, I'm just making a little side journey here. You see, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know exactly when this all started, maybe five to seven years ago, I'm thinking, uh, there was this whole teaching on the courts of heaven that was going on. People were saying, you know, you have to, uh, if you want your prayers answered, if you want to see God, you know, work in your life and all of that, then you need to go to the court of heaven. You need to defend your case. And if you defend your case successfully, you will get a breakthrough. You'll get an answer. Your healing will come and so on and so forth. Because... Um, Satan is accusing you in the court of heaven. And that's the reason why answer to prayers are delayed. And I'm just summarizing the general gist of the teaching and how it goes about. But, you know, even when I just heard that whole idea, the concept, uh, it just doesn't hold with scripture. Why? Because... As far as the New Testament is concerned, now Old Testament, I, we know, okay, Jesus had not yet died on the cross, but when you come after the cross, uh, we know the case is closed. And you find that, you know, it repeated in so many chapters. In John 16, Jesus himself said, uh, of, uh, you know, he said, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He said, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. That means 
the, the actual Greek there is, is, a, is a legal term. The ruler of this world, referring to the devil, is judged. That means the sentence has been pronounced. Uh, the verdict has been announced. He's been judged. So if the verdict has been announced, what is the use of uh, any more? There is no more court cases. And then you come here to Romans 8. Verse 33 and 34, it says, you know, who is going to bring a charge against you? Who's going to accuse you? Because God has already justified you. Who can condemn you? The one who removed all condemnation is right there, at, standing there at the right hand of the Father. The work has been done. He finished the work. And then he stood at the right hand of the Father. So when we understand that, then we don't buy into this whole idea of you having to go into the courts of heaven to defend your case when the accuser of the brethren is there. And, and then if you defend your case, then you get your answer to prayer or you get your healing or you get your deliverance or your breakthrough. Right? I'm just, this is just a side thing. So you know, I never subscribed to that teaching and we never taught it or preached it at APC. Uh, because it doesn't doesn't hold with the teaching of you know the finished work of the cross, and the fact that we are justified. Just a side note there, right? But these verses are po so powerful. Verse thirty and thirty four, thirty three and thirty four. Paul is asking, "Hey, uh, here's a sum. I've already told you in Romans five. You know we've been justified and uh, we have peace with God. And Romans eight, there is no condemnation. So this is a summary of it. Who can charge you? Nobody." Who can condemn you? Nobody. Case is closed. And then last one. Verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Now, very interesting. This actually ties back to what he mentioned in Romans 5. Verses 1 through 5. You know, Romans 5, he said, you know, Hope uh, doesn't disappoint us because the love of God is poured into our hearts. We have this hope, but this hope is consolidated. It is strengthened because God's love is poured into our hearts. And here it says, I am so, verse 35, I am so assured of this love. That's why we have this hope. So hope is undergirded by this love that's been poured into our hearts. We are so confident of this love. So he says, who will separate us from the love of God? So we're going through the sufferings of this present time. Uh, we are going through it with perseverance, with patient endurance. And, uh, and then he lists all kinds of things, right? Tribulation, persecution, famine. He says, you know, life or death, angels, principalities, all kinds of whatever can come against us in this life. Whether they are natural things or they are spiritual things. So he talks about principalities and powers, angels. He says, the love of God, which is poured into our hearts, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And therefore, whatever we go through, we are coming out as more than conquerors. That means, and you can imagine Paul, he's trying to tell us that we're not just victorious, we are more than victorious. So he's saying, hey, whatever we go through in life, we're going to come out victorious. I mean, not just victorious. We're going to come out as more than conquerors. Because he says nothing's going to be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it says nothing can separate us from this wonderful love that God has for us. And that is what gives us hope to go through all these things. On. So it's like a summary now of all that he's, you know, taken us through from 
uh, from chapters four, where he talked about faith, but five, six, seven, eight, it's like a summary. What do we say to all these things? We, if God is for us, God is for us. God will take care of us. He'll provide for us. Nobody can accuse us. Nobody can condemn us. And nobody can separate us. So not, nobody and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's why we journey through life as more than conquerors. All right. So this is our assurance that whatever we go through, God is bringing us out as more than conquerors. Not only do we overcome, but God is making all of everything work together for good. That is for the fulfilling of his purpose, conforming us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And ultimately, he's going to redeem us. He's going to bring us into that glorious liberty of the children of God. So that brings us to the end of chapter eight. Any questions before we just, I'll just give an introduction to the next um, chapter, actually the next three chapters. Okay, feel free to ask any questions anytime, okay? So having brought us to this point, where he's you know, taught us about justification, he's taught us about identification, he's taught us about how we overcome and live the victorious life and uh, even the midst of all the suffering, etc. It's very interesting. Chapters 9, 10, 11, he actually uh, focuses on a completely different theme. And it's probably because a lot of the people in Rome, remember we said Rome was a mixed crowd. There were Jews and there were Gentiles. They're not believers. He's writing to believers, of course, but there were solid Jewish believers. So while he has presented everything, uh, you know, so far, which applies, you know, to everyone who believes in Jesus, Romans 9, 10, 11, again, is a very unique portion of Paul's writings. Again, I think I'm going to be saying this quite often. He doesn't discuss this anywhere else. Uh, maybe a little bit he mentions, you know, in Ephesians 2 that, you know, Jews and Gentiles are, are, are made one and, uh, and all of that. Or, you know, there will be a, a, a verse here in Ephesians 2 or in Galatians. He says there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. But other than that passing statement, he never addresses this whole issue in depth anywhere else. The the main focus of the next three chapters, 9, 10, 11, is, so what is God doing with the Jews, the Jewish people? What is he doing with them? Uh, and it's very interesting how Paul presents this truth to us. The question is, has God abandoned the Jewish people, because now he has the church, believers in Jesus, you know, these people whom he has predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, which he has so beautifully mentioned here in Romans 8. Just because God has got these people, has he abandoned the Jews, the Jewish people whom he called through Abraham? What's going on with them? And uh, so we've got two sets of people God is working with right now. How does all this come together? And what should the church's attitude be towards the Jewish people? Right? Because remember, on the other side of this letter are people, some of them, not all of them, but some of them who have actually left the Jewish faith, the Judaism, and embraced Jesus Christ. 
So for them, they are still wondering, okay, now I'm following Jesus. Jesus was a Jew, a descendant of Abraham. We are all descendants of Abraham. We're believing in Jesus as the Messiah. You're saying we're part of the church. You're saying we are, you know, these people who are the sons of God, we're heirs, and we justified all of that. But uh, what about the people, the Jewish people who have not yet believed? And what is God doing with them? And in answering that question, again, again, this is, um, uh, it's getting a little bit more intense, actually, in chapter 9. This whole idea of predestination comes up again. 9, 10, 11, you'll see it in all these three chapters. This whole idea of predestination. So chapters 9, 10, 11 are pretty strong chapters in addressing predestination, you know. Because God shows the Jewish people ahead of time. And he called Abraham and and he promised so many things to Abraham. So this was his plan even before the church came into existence. So Paul, this whole uh, this whole truth of predestined comes up in the context of the Jewish people, right? Because God had a plan for them. Right? So uh, that is another you know uh, theme that comes up. So it's not only the Jewish people. Uh, what is God doing with them? How does the church uh, relate to the Jews? But also this whole thing about his plan, which he determined before beforehand that he was going to do with them. What's happened to that plan? How is God going to do it? Okay. So chapters 9, 10, 11, Paul is addressing this basic question. Jewish people, what about them? Yeah. So let's spend maybe a few, at least go, go into a few verses. I know uh, we, we, we just have less than 10 minutes, but let's get started. Uh, Romans chapter 9, we'll read the first five verses, please. Somebody could read that. Romans 9, 1 to 5. Romans 9. I tell the truth in the Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing my witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow, the continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself bear accused from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the convince, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the entirely blessed God. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, Paul is now changing attention or focus. He says, okay, I want to tell you the truth. Like, it's like, he's, he's actually like unburdening or opening up his heart. Okay. So, he's saying, hey, I, I want to tell you something that's really on my heart. And I'm not lying. It's, it's not, I'm not making this up. This is really on my heart. And... Um, you know, he says, uh, verse 2, you know, I have great sorrow, continual grief in my heart. It's just like, look, I, I'm actually opening up my heart. I'm un unburdening what I'm carrying in my heart to you, is what he's saying. If you put it in, you know, modern, paraphrase it in modern language. And what's his heart all, all about? He's, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's he, verse 3, he says, uh, and this is very strong. He says, I wish I could be accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, 
according to the flesh. I mean, this is, I don't know how to articulate this. He's saying, I wish I could be accursed, anathema, Greek. I wish I could be accursed from Jesus for the sake of my Jewish brothers, brethren. Ah, oh. I means this is how much he is longing for his people, his meaning the Jewish people, the Israelites, Israel, for them to come to know Christ. He's willing to give up. So I, I, I don't mind if I'm literally to put it in plain words. I don't mind if I go to hell, so long as they can come to Jesus. That, that is very strong. That's the burden he's carrying for the Jews. Some side notes I just want to you know bring out here in this. Look at verse 1. He says, My conscience bears witness, bear me witness in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. So this conscience bearing witness, the Holy Spirit also bears witness. Very interesting. What is conscience? Conscience is the voice of your own spirit. It's what your spirit is telling you. So remember, your the human conscience has been pre-programmed by God with what's right and what's wrong. So it's the human conscience. And the human conscience is telling us, speaking to us. And he's saying, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit is also bearing witness. So there are two witnesses. My own conscience, what the Holy Spirit is saying. So, you know, sometimes we tell uh, we ask people, somebody says, you know, what should I do? Then sometimes I'll ask them, what do you feel like doing? So I'm not asking feel, meaning as in the flesh. But I'm asking, what is your conscience saying? And that means you're going deeper than the soul realm. You're going into your spirit. What do you feel like doing in your spirit? That's your conscience. Now, that's you. What do you feel? And we're not asking, what is the Holy Spirit saying? I'm saying, what do you feel like doing? That's your conscience. Now, the Holy Spirit will also bear witness meaning by his peace, by his sense of peace, or sometimes the sense of saying no. Right? So the Holy Spirit also bears witness. So there are two witnesses from within. There's a witness of our own conscience. And then there's a witness of the Holy Spirit. If your conscience is giving you an okay, most likely, and if you've been feeding your conscience with the word of God, then most likely what your conscience is telling you is right. And then you also listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit giving me peace? Or is he saying no? Is he raising a red flag? So then you've got two witnesses from your own spirit about a certain matter. Now in this case, Paul's case, in this very specific case, it is about his heart for the Jewish people. His heart for the Jewish people. That's, that's the context. He says, you know, this is what I, I, I feel for the Jewish people. 
And my own conscience is telling me this. Uh, my conscience is clear. And the Holy Spirit is also with me. He knows what I'm saying. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to highlight these two points here from verse 1. Uh, we will pick this up again next week, uh, Romans 9, uh, as we go through uh, Romans uh, 9, 10, 11, and just look at what, what the revelation concerning the church and Israel. That's Romans 9, 10, 11. Okay. Uh, I know our time is up. Let's just pray together and we will dismiss. I would uh, request somebody to pray with us as a class and we will dismiss. Anyone can pray? I'll pray, Pastor. Thank you, Lord, for um, letting us know the truth, Lord, from the book of Romans. Lord, uh... Okay, Aaron, Aaron dropped off. Uh, can somebody finish prayer? <laughs> Father God, we just come before your throne, Father God. Father God, thanking you for your revelation, Father God. Thanking you for your word and your your, your things, Father God. Uh, we we uh, receive, Father God. Father God, just help us to understand more and more and deeper, Father God, to your words, Father God, that we can receive and we can apply our life and uh, we can apply to your kingdom work, Father God. Thanking you, Father God, that all promises, Father God, that you 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 given us, Father God. Father God, thanking you that the the power and the the the, the word, Father God, that uh, the present situation and we are leading, Father God, and the more glorious day, Father God, through you, you, your your presence, Father God. Thanking you for everything, Father God. Thanking you for today class, Father God. Thanking you, sir, and all the students, Father God. Thanking you, Father God. Thanking you, listening our prayer, Father God. Thanking you, Almighty Jesus, name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, We'll take a quick break and go to our next class. Thank you. God Thank you, bless. Sir.